Tough cookie, stop calling the symptoms of more than half the population atypical. Last week, not only did I give you two videos that were quite deep in terms of their topics, but they were quite long as well, so I appreciate you watching them and leaving your feedback. In today's video, I'd like to address some of the most common critiques and criticisms from those videos, in addition to responding to comments as I usually do. Let's get started. Stop calling the symptoms of more than half the population atypical. I got this comment a lot and I totally understand why. The tricky part about recognizing heart attack symptoms in female patients is that they are often masked and they often present atypically. It sounds like I'm calling the symptoms of a, a heart attack atypical because they happen in the female population. That's not the case. The majority of all people, men and women, experience heart attacks with chest pain. Now, if you're having jaw pain, stomach pain, nausea, fatigue, and you're having a heart attack, that is an atypical presentation, whether you're a male or female. What I was trying to say in the video is that if you're a woman, you're more likely to have these atypical symptoms. Not that all women experience atypical symptoms and men experience classical symptoms. That's not how that works. Bella 24, New Jersey. You mentioned women use a more narrative style of talking and that makes doctors have more errors. Isn't that a form of victim blaming? Bella, I can see how you can get there. What I think the study was trying to accomplish was to figure out reasons why women were being misdiagnosed diagnosed when it comes to the way they present their illnesses. Now, this is not saying that it's the woman's fault for having this narrative style. This study is identifying that this is the cause, and then we can further address it by educating doctors to be better suited to accept this type of presentation. Some advice that I give to all my patients, irrespective of their sex, is that they should not be afraid to be outspoken. If a doctor is doing something that they're not comfortable with, or if they feel a doctor is missing something, they should speak up. If that doctor's not willing to listen and communicate, get a second opinion. That's not always feasible in a given moment, but it's important to advocate for your own health. This is not to excuse bad doctor's habits. This is simply a practical solution for a problem that I see occurring quite often. John's Lama, I hear you, but to be perfectly honest, you sound like you are justifying and making excuses. I understand you are a medical provider, but please try and see this from a patient's perspective. It would be more helpful. John Zalana, I'm sorry you feel that way. I really do and try and see all of these situations from a patient's perspective. Not only have I been a patient, but my family have been patients. I lost my mom to cancer and I spent a lot of time in hospital. So I do know uh, how the system works intimately from a professional perspective and a patient's perspective. That being said, the purpose of me doing the reaction video to this was not to defend doctors. It was simply to take a 360 look at the issue and really point out that while bias and discrimination definitely occur, we need to talk about it. I also didn't wanna lose focus and see that there's a lot of other issues that are contributing to these disparities that weren't discussed on this bit. J Della 10. I liked Height's book, but I can't help but see a bit of contradiction here because he says kids are anti-fragile, so don't overprotect them, but yet he wants them to be kept away from social media altogether. Jonathan Haidt made a really good point that we had to edit out simply for time's sake, because this was a 100 plus minute interview and we did only show you 48 minutes, so I'll let him say his take, but I have a slightly different opinion on the matter. Okay, Haidt, you're saying that we need to let kids out more and not supervise them and kids have to climb trees and they have yeah. to get injured, but then you're saying we shouldn't let them on social media. Aren't you coddling them and overprotecting them from social media? And I say, well, yeah, you know, logic, that's a good point, but let's see if it's the same kind of learning. You know, when you climb a tree and you get in trouble, you get scared or you, or you fall or hurt yourself, you learn, you don't avoid trees, you actually climb trees better the next time. But when you're shamed on social media, what happens? And I always ask the, the say everybody who's in Gen Z, how many of you have been on it since you were 10 or 11 years old? A lot of hands go up. I say, okay, do you think that being on social media early and being shamed and being attacked, do you think that overall that's made you tougher and more independent because I've been shamed and attacked so many times, I don't care? Or do you think it's made you more hesitant? It's made you more self-censoring? It's made you more careful about what you say? And the overwhelming consensus, it's a large majority say it's the former, that they, they I'm, no, the latter, I'm sorry. Yes. The large majority yes. say, that it's that they're more, they're more, they're more self-censoring, basically more cowardly. In my opinion, we don't want to expose children to unnecessary chronic stress or chronic trauma. And I think social media falls into that category. If my child goes to school and gets called a name and comes home upset about it, that's good. That's an acute stress. They're going to learn how to deal with that. But now if they're being called that name every single day at school being bullied, then they come home and they're being bullied on social media and it never stops. That now crosses the line into chronic stress slash trauma 
trauma where I need to step in. My second point on social media is that it really functions like a drug because of the way that it affects our minds. The likes create a dopamine hit much like vape pens do, cigarette smoking, alcohol use does. And we don't let young children use those because they haven't quite developed the frontal cortex, the decision-making part of their brain. So exposing them to social media earlier on can really affect the way they mature and their circuits form. So I think keeping children away from social media until they're mature, and that line is different for everybody, is not a bad idea. This is the first time I've turned off one of your videos. The implication that children shouldn't be protected from bullying or emotional abuse is ridiculous. It doesn't make children stronger, but it does make many of them suicidal, including me. Now, Sarah, I'm incredibly sad to hear that, and I'm sorry you had that experience watching our video. The type of conversation that Jonathan Haidt and I are having is really fraught with nuance, because it's really important that we don't just say, oh, all children should be bullied and they'll become stronger and that's all good. That's not what we're saying, and it's really important that we pay attention to that bit of nuance. What we're saying is that acute stress, small amounts of struggle, challenges are good for children. What we don't wanna see happen is children exposed to serious traumatic events, chronic abuse or bullying, because in that case, it changes from a healthy challenge to an unhealthy challenge. Now that line is different for every child based on how they've developed maturity, based on what experiences they've had in their lives, based on their parents even. And that's really up to the parents to decide where that line lies. Both too much and too little intervention can have adverse effects. Pharaoh, Mike, I am a real doctor. Also, Mike, I don't know my blood type. Oh my God, there were so many comments about this. It is perfectly normal to not know your blood type. For example, if I have a patient come into the office and I order them a complete blood count, a complete metabolic panel, vitamin test, cholesterol panel, thyroid panel, whatever it is, it doesn't automatically come in to tell me their blood type. That's a special test that I have to order. And guess what? Your insurance is gonna say, well, why did you need to know that? Why are we paying for it? If it's not of medical necessity, you have to pay for it. The one time that your insurance will pay for it that will apply to a lot of people is in a preoperative setting. So if you come to me and you're about to go to for surgery, you need clearance, I'm the one that's gonna be doing that clearance. I may order uh, a blood test just to make sure that if something happens during the operation, we have your blood type ready to go and uh, save your life. Panda Red, my health economy teacher told me to always be positive, but never HIV positive. <laughs> if you're HIV positive, that's okay too. We can figure it out. In fact, the control for HIV has gotten so good that the life expectancy for someone who takes treatment carefully and properly and appropriately for HIV is essentially the same life expectancy as for the average person of that same sex and age. Kim Carpenter, I have epilepsy and I was wondering what goes on in my brain whilst that happens. Kim, that's a really great question. Now I'm not a neurologist, but I'll sort of give you a very basic explanation of what happens. In one part of your brain, there happens to be an area of overexcitation, almost like an electric storm. And then that starts spreading throughout your entire brain. And that's how you can develop epilepsy and go into a full on seizure where you're shaking, you're feeling things, seeing things are confused because it activates all different parts of your brain. Interestingly enough, if patients fail medical therapy, meaning taking all these types of medications for their seizures, one of the possible treatments is surgical intervention, literally taking out the part of the brain where we've isolated the beginning of that seizure activity to that pinpoint part of the brain. Regan RN, Dr. Mike, where is the difference between an MD and a DO and which is better. You phrased your question in the exact title that I have a video already existing. And that video just hit a million views. I'm gonna link it down below in the description. It's called, what is the difference between an MD and a DO and which is better? I'm very passionate about this subject. I've actually partnered with the American Osteopathic Association, which represents well over 100,000 practicing DOs and we're gonna be giving all sorts of little tidbits about the differences and what makes a DO special. So stay tuned for that. Carolyn Bice, video idea. Can you do a video about surgery, anxiety, what to expect? I'm having surgery for the first time and I'm really nervous. Caroline, this is such a good idea. Part of my job as a family medicine doctor is to do pre-surgical clearances, which means that right before a patient gets to go under the knife, they come to me first to make sure that they're healthy enough to go for surgery, or at least 
optimized well enough to go for surgery. During this process, I have really in-depth conversations about their fears, about what they need to be doing beforehand, and I think that could make for a really good quality video. I know what questions most people have, and I know what language I need to use to explain that to them. If you want that type of video, someone's gotta be the leader here and put a really good comment down below this video and upvote that bad boy. Let's make the limit for it 5,000 upvotes. If you get that, dedicated video to pre-surgical anxiety. Addy Paul, question, what happens if you stay upside down for an extremely long time? You're gonna get a headache <laughs> because gravity is gonna change the amount of blood that's going to your head and you're gonna get a lot more blood pooling there. Now your legs are used to this because obviously you're standing and upright for the majority of the day. In fact, the veins in your legs have natural valves that as each time your heart pumps, those valves open and then close to make sure that the blood doesn't automatically fall and pull to the bottom of your legs. You may see this in some people as they get older when those valves become incompetent or they have damage to their veins and you see that their legs are constantly swollen all day, that's because blood is pooling down there and their venous system is a little bit abnormal. Luxel, health question, why can't I see when I close my eyes? Because you have eyelids? <laughs> and they're not transparent. There's actually some animals I know that have transparent eyelids and then they're regular eyelids so they can see underwater. Uh, if you know what kind of animal that is, drop it down below in the comments because I need a refresher. I think it's a toad or a snake. Ugh. Oh, alligators. Whatever. Jennifer Saunders. This man really just pulled out nuts out of his dishwasher, put them in his drinking glass. There are way too many jokes to be made about that entire situation. Man, like, I was so tired and delirious when I was filming that. Yes, I store my nuts in my dishwasher and I put them in the drinking glass. Deal with it. Jocelyn Raj, Dr. Mike, I love nuts. Fans, start mailing all kind of nuts to him. Actually, if you want to send me some interesting nuts, I'm down. I gotta be careful when I say things like that. I feel like I'm gonna go to my P.O. box and be unpleasantly surprised. What's in the box? I know many of you were scared off by the 48 minute mark on my latest anxiety video, but I urge you, make the time, check out this video, leave me your comments, because I'm still very active in that comment section. And as always, stay happy and healthy. <laughs>